Well, for those of you who are interested in sitting through a little analysis here that's been done, what we're going to do is we're going to solve the Orion mystery once and for all. Now, I've already solved this thing several times, but I've kind of got pieces here and pieces there. Um, without recalling, being able to recall all of them at once, I have put most of them together. And as you can see, I've got a lot of tabs at the top of the screen where we go across culture. Uh, and as you can see right here in my media player, I've got all these various clips. Now these various clips come from different lectures and I'll try to be as clear as I can where they come from. Um, the top one here uh, comes from Kabbalah, this comes from the vision of Hermes, uh, this comes from the great hermetic literature, uh, this comes from the casting the sun and the moon, I believe that comes from one of the hermetic literatures. Uh, the mirror of the microprosopus, macroprosopus, that also comes from Kabbalah. Uh, pyramid and universal mind that comes from the initiation of the pyramid as above so below I believe that is part of the great hermetic literature uh, Hermes and the pattern uh, this also this comes from the Jacob's ladder to the stars uh, and then this also this last one comes from Jacob's ladder to the stars so I've assembled all of these little clips together we're going to go through those um, we're also going to take a look at the Papyrus Avani, uh, Wallace Budge, uh, utterances in the pyramid texts, uh, things from Kabbalah that we see here down in this text. Uh, we've got stuff to look at from the Mayan cultures and more stuff from the uh, utterances of the pyramid texts. This, this is the virgin of the world where Hermes is speaking to Asclepius. And uh, we've also got the Gospel of the Egyptians. And then we've got stuff from the Zohar and also the Gospel of Judas. So we're going all around here. We're also going to be looking at Revelation. That we see here Revelation 10, the seventh angel. Uh, and then I've also got. Uh, information that I've pulled specifically for some of the things that we're going to see at the beginning, uh, Colossians 1.15, uh, and then several of the uh, verses after this. So I've pulled all of this stuff together. It comes from the Zohar, it comes from the Kabbalah, it comes from the Egyptian mysteries, it comes from the Gnostic texts of the Egyptians, um, the Mayans, it comes from all over the place. This is the uh, Orion mystery and it is solved but I must stress that it is mysterious it is the mysteries it can't become uh, it can't fall into the classification of religion only it doesn't go into the classification of science only it kind of falls in between and uh, because there are things about it that science will be not able to prove yet there are things about it that you can show to science and say well disprove this and they can't do it such as the images now the image that I've shown you with the creation of Adam that I've shown you before is extremely important and it's many things together in our understanding of what is going on here this image that you see here which I think is really funny. I had somebody in my last video tell me I'm hesitant to believe this image because they have scientifically proven that the Orion Nebula is so many years old. Well, scientifically proven, they haven't proven jack because there's things about the Orion constellation that are extremely easy to see such as the whole Fibonacci loop that covers the whole Orion constellation and centers right on the Orion Nebula and the stars that they declare like Bellatrix which is the closest to us is much older than they declare the Orion Nebula. It makes no sense that all the stars leading up to the very center point of the Fibonacci spiral would be all younger than the very center point of it when it's clearly showing that that's where everything is emanating from is that area. So this is a really important image 
because it ties a lot of things together. We see the stars all around it, but we see this archetypal image, and this archetypal image is the image of human brain faced in right profile. The, this is not a matter of pareidolia. This is a matter of image recognition. So for those of you who have knee-jerk reactions and like to talk about pareidolia, I suggest you look up the difference between pareidolia and image recognition. When we have things like this, where these images, although they are not exact, they are clearly repeated all the way through this image. When you can see what you're looking at right now and see that these images contain the same uh, shadings, the same images such as her, uh, and then if we even dig into, dig deeper into the image at a very close up level, this is called image recognition. So if you are a pareidolia person, make sure you know the difference between pareidolia and image recognition. This is image recognition. And what makes this so important is that that was created 100 years before the first telescope was ever invented. And we see this kind of thing happening all over these cathedrals. Just like when we take a look inside of the, um, the Church of the Jeshu. Church of the Jesu shows us the image that we see right here. In the Church of the Jesu, showing us the whole Orion constellation. And the, the interesting thing about this is this image was created in 1679. Yet the clouds that you see right here were not discovered until the late 1800s. So this is where we have something very mysterious going on. It can easily be proven to science, yet science is too afraid to look at it. But we have the mystery solved here, and we need to understand what it all means. This um, whole pointing to this particular area of the Orion Nebula goes all the way back into ancient Samaria. We always see the winged disc sitting on top of the Tree of Life. We have the three belt stars right here and the winged disc is sitting right here next to the Orion Nebula, showing us the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a listen to some of these clips and as we go through I'm going to thumb through some of the uh, tabs that we have up here and hope you guys enjoy this. We're going to solve the mystery real quick. So here we go. For in a sense, deity becomes a symbol of earth, an earth of deity. Deity becomes a symbol of earth, an earth of deity. The mysterious part about all this is the as above, so below principle that we're going to see regarding a mirror that exists in both the heavens, the heavens being considered the Orion Nebula, and earth. The Macroprosophus represented the revelation of deity in the creation process. And there emerged out of the mystery of infinite being the gigantic figure like the giant of the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. A mysterious and colossal figure with one foot upon the oceans and the other upon the land. Okay. There's a couple of things that he said there that are important. He said that the what came out of the mystery of infinite being, okay, which is the Son. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, he also said this. Colossal figure with one foot upon the oceans and the other upon the land. Okay, so... Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, with one foot up on the oceans and the other upon the land. And if we take a look in Revelation 10:2, and he had a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And in 10:5, we see that the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and the earth lifted his hand up to heaven. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the earth and the sea. So we can see here that he's speaking of the same thing. So let's go ahead and listen to the next clip. And this is from the vision of Hermes. 
He beholds rising out of the deepness and darkness of things anthropos, the divine man. So we have the same description of something rising out of the deep and darkness. The first creation, which is the Son, which is Christ. And it's called the divine man, it's called Anthropos, which is the same as the first Adam. It's the same as Adam, which is really all of mankind, but it represents the first archetypal image that comes out of the infinite, which represents man. Anthropos seems to stand in the midst of all things. He appears to stand as an isolated and lonely creation. This is the mysterious, primordial, archetypal, universal man. This is the total man. This mysterious great man of the Zohar, who stands with his head in the heavens, one foot upon the earth and the other upon the ocean. There's another version, one foot upon the earth and the other upon the earth, on the, one foot upon the earth and the other upon the oceans. The same person he's talking about, the first things that comes out of the infinite of creation. This is the great macrocosmic man. And this man in the Hermetic doctrine is the one and only begotten son of the father. And this is the man that stands forth as Anthropos, the man which is the son of the mind, the son of reason, in whose nature have been gathered all of the celestial elements. For this man is the final and most perfect of the archetypal projections of the mind of the Creator. This man, therefore, is that being made and fashioned in the image of the reason of God. The efforts have been made to parallel this man with the Christ of Christianity. Okay, so they parallel this man with the Christ of Christianity because Christ is the firstborn out of the infinite, which is the image of the invisible God, just like man was created in the image of God. This is the Christ, which is the firstborn over all creation, which is also created in the image of God. As the only begotten, and also strangely as the celestial Adam. Celestial Adam. That is the same as what we see here. This is the archetype of man. And this is the celestial Adam, which is the same as the Merkaba, which is the same as the chariot. For this man, fashioned by the Father, is truly the Redeemer of the world. It is truly the creature that was made to be proprietor over all things. It was this creature that was given the right to be a citizen in space. Uh, this great man, this mysterious shadowy archetype, was a perfect, magnificent, heroic creature, almost in itself a god, yet a product of a god. And into this archetype, all of the essentials and essences of the divine nature were united, so that truly it was the noblest work of the Creator and was really a kind of projection of himself. There may be a parallel to this in the idea of Osiris being reborn in his own son Horus. Okay, a projection of himself, which is the same thing that we see here. He is an image of the invisible God. And he said being reborn into his own son Horus. Now you've got to remember that these are all just different versions of the same story. And in Colossians one nineteen, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ.
being reborn into his own son Horus. God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Now let's take a look at the Papyrus of Ani real quick. Osiris. Now Osiris would be considered the invisible God. Homage to the Osiris, Lord of Eternity, King of the Gods, whose names are manifold, whose forms are holy, thou being of hidden form in the temples whose cause holy. Thou art the governor of Tatu, Busiris, which is in the center of the, uh, the uh, Nile Delta, and we'll see why that's important here pretty soon. And then we see in Utterance 442, the king becomes a star. Now, what I find interesting is that the, a lot of these mainstream or big-time Egyptologists, I think the reason why they haven't put this together um, is because I think the typical mentality is is that we start thinking about what people could versus what they could not do a long time ago, like they weren't able to see things like that, or uh, and so they 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 totally bypass the idea that the way the best place to become a star in Orion uh, would be in a place called the Orion Nebula. But I think it has something to do with them being able to determine what people could versus what they could not do. But these people a long time ago knew things that we don't even understand now. Hermes, you know, is just an archetype of the story that understands this type of thing. But he says, Lo, he has come as Orion. Lo, Osiris has come as Orion. And he says, uh, Sky conceived you and... Uh, and Orion, dusk gave birth to you, and Orion, who lives by the God's command, you shall live, you shall rise with Orion in the eastern sky, and you shall set with Orion in the, in the western sky. And the Orion Nebula is a companion of Orion. It sits in the middle of the seven lampstands, which are the seven stars of Orion. And Osiris coming as Orion, which means the invisible God, made himself manifest into the first born over all creation, which is the Orion Nebula, which some might call uh, Horus. Some might call Orion. It's kind of, uh, uh, you might consider them both one, because Horus, which would be the mind that surrounds Osiris, uh, is kind of attached to the invisible. So it's kind of a mediator between the material world and what we know is as the invisible world. So when we take a look at this right here, we have Lo Osiris has come as Orion, so we have the invisible creating that first point, Kether, and then, which this area right here is the Christ. This is the Christ. This area is the firstborn over all creation. But it is a level of Christ. We might think of this as uh, the Christ of the human civilization, because this is the archetype of, of the man, of man that we see right here. And we can also see that Christ is attached to Osiris in the sense that Osiris is right here, and Christ is attached to it. It's the mediator between the middle, between the material world, and between the infinite. It's the intercessor. So, take a listen to the next part here. For it was through this great man or universal being which it had fashioned that reason came into its perfect rulership over matter. Because this archetypal being was virtuous, gracious, full of light and wisdom, defective in nothing, deficient in nothing, because within it were all the potentials and powers of the eternal reason. For this being was not embodied. It was simply a great design, a great living archetype. So this being was not embodied, it was a big design, it was a living archetype. That's exactly what we see right here. It's not embodied all in, the, in material. It is a big design, it is a big archetype. It's the same archetype that we see when we take a look at Michelangelo's painting here that he did 100 years before the first telescope. 
And when we take a look at the first one born over all things, for in him all things were created, things in the heaven on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. And if we take a look at the Gospel of the Egyptians, that same archetypal universal man, which is Adamus, he came forth at the place of the cloud of the great light. Adamus is a light which radiated from the light. He is the eye of the light, for this is the first man. He through whom, to, he through whom and to whom everything came into being, without whom nothing came into being. And that's the same thing that we read here in Colossians 1.16. This is the same archetypal universal man that is being described. It's the Christ, but it's also Adam, which represents man. Because Adam, in Hebrew, actually means man. That power Hermes calls the divine mind. He calls it also universal reason. He says that the firstborn of the infinite is the extension of the infinite itself into the field of pure cognition. This mind, in the Hermetic philosophy, becomes the only begotten of the Father. It becomes, strangely, both the only begotten and the firstborn. For we refer to Jesus as the only begotten and at the same time assume that deity is the creator also of ourselves. The deity by the pronunciation of a determination within its own nature engenders within itself that aspect of itself which is mind. This mind or this cognition then becomes strangely the instrument of the divine purpose. It becomes the apex of the ascending pyramid of creation and the base of the descending period, a pyramid of the creating power. Okay, so we need to take a look at uh, the understanding of why do we see mind first. Well, when we see mind, we're looking at things born, the first born of consciousness. And the way that the universe shows this type of thing as, as firstborn of consciousness is it starts at the pineal gland. And we know this because we can take a look at any images from uh, creation and we can see the same thing we can, as far as man goes. And we can see it also in the universal archetype of man. Because if we take a look at this image that Michelangelo created, what he created is a brain in right profile. But if we take a look at the whole Orion constellation, it gives us a clue into understanding the center of the vortex of man, which is the pineal gland. Let me show you what I'm talking about real quick on that. This is a, a fetus, a human fetus. And if we take a look at the golden spiral, we can see that the golden spiral, uh, it ends up right inside the head area close to where the pineal gland would be if this thing were more developed. Let me show you another image. If we take that same fetus and we put it inside a brain, we can see that the brain has the same um, curvatures in the golden spiral that we see in the fetus. And where the pineal gland exists inside the brain is basically right where uh, the head area is or where the pineal gland would be in the fetus. Let me show you another image. This is the human brain that we can see right here, and I have a shell on, on top of it, a seashell. And then we can see the way it covers the whole brain and where the center of the vortex is, is actually where the pineal gland is in the brain. If we continue this thing out and use the golden spiral all the way out, the next pass on a golden spiral with the true 1.618 passes right by and separates the head from the body. And at the next pass, it goes right by and uh, and passes just next to the coccyx. So we can see that the center of the vortex in man is the pineal gland. We look at the brain and our main archetype that we see, it's all fractal. So when you take a look at the whole Orion constellation and the Barnard's loop circling around, 
you can see that the Orion nebula ends in the same location as the pineal gland of the brain that we see right here. So if we take a look at the whole Orion constellation, it all circles in to the Orion nebula, and we know that the Orion nebula itself is a brain, and the very center area of that, this triangular area that you see right here, is the pineal gland of the brain. So this is the center of the vortex on man, which is the pineal gland. And that's the reason why it was so revered a long time ago, I'm pretty sure. So we can see from the fetus all the way to, um, to what we see when we take a look at an adult human brain, we can see that the, the golden spiral all centers in on the area of the pineal gland. Here's another image right here. showing the same kind of thing that we see right here where the top of the brain covers or touches both areas of the pyramid and we can see that the shell centers right in on the king's chamber inside the pyramid. And right down here we see the brain right here, the pineal gland centering in. And this is the reason why the king's chamber is slightly offset from the middle because the way that the golden spiral works, the golden spiral is also slightly offset from the center as you can see. Now continuing with our descriptions and our lectures here from our clips from uh, Manley Hall, this is we're going to start getting into the mysterious side of things because somebody knew that the Michelangelo painting was tied to this particular macrocosmic man. Listen to what Manley Hall has to say now. He was usually personified or impersonated as a most venerable person a great superhuman being. A being, however, fashioned in the likeness of a man. A being like the mysterious and noble figure casting from his hands the sun and moon as represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Okay, now that's extremely significant because that directly ties this particular character that you see right here to what he just said casting from his hands the sun and moon all right let's back it up just a little bit and listen to it again a being like the mysterious and noble figure casting from his hands the sun and moon as represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome and he's obviously referring to this person here and that is the same as this person that we see right here that he's describing as this macrocosmic man. And this ties us into the mysteries because Michelangelo painted this 100 years before the first telescope yet we can see that all of the confirmations and even the descriptions even according to Manley Hall are all there. Now remember that this image that you see of the brain and right profile is not just derived out of nothing it's derived because we have this image right here from Michelangelo and we know that he painted this in right profile because Michelangelo was a Kabbalist we know this from Secrets of the Sistine Chapel from uh, Rabbi Benjamin Bleck uh, and the detail that they did inside the of the analysis of the Sistine Chapel we know that what he painted here was he painted the Merkaba he painted the macrocosmic man the heavenly atom the celestial atom uh, the Christ, all of these things, these are all the same thing. And so this image right here, which refers to the mind, the archetypal image of the mind, this is actually derived from what we see in Michelangelo's painting. And this is the reason why it fits on there so easily. And this is the reason why we see that this yellow triangular area right here is the same as this dark area right here, which is exactly where the pineal gland sits inside the human brain. Around whose body the stars and planets moved, and whose face was always in profile, because deity was re represented always with one eye. So he's describing in Ka uh, Kabbalah the macroprosopis, which is the same thing. This mysterious macroprosopis was the clothed God, clothed in creation. 
God as creation. Now that is also in confirmation with what we see here. It's no longer the invisible God. It is now God moved into physical reality. As made up of a great cluster of stars, and it was surrounded by angels full of eyes, which were the stars. And its vehicle was the Merkava of Ezekiel, the chariot of righteousness. This macroprosophus, or the long face, rises above the her And this is where we get into the mirror part of all of this. This is also very mysterious, uh, as I will show you. And this is the reason why the pyramids in Egypt were placed where they were. Why the pattern of the stars was placed where they were, because they were trying to show the mirror that exists between the heaven and the earth. Horizon of infinites like a sun rising from darkness and because this horizon of infinites resembles more than anything else a great ocean it is represented as a mirror and as the face rises above the reflection of the face inverted appears in the ocean beneath okay so let me get to a couple images here for you this is what they were trying to show us in Egypt Now the reason why they placed the pyramids where they did, just at the base of the Nile Delta, is because that's where the center of the circle is. Now the center of the where the Orion where the uh, Nile Delta is, right at the base of it, that's actually the very center of all the land masses on the planet. And right here, the very center of the circle is just at the base of the trapezium of the Orion Nebula, and that is the center of this whole cloud. Now what you'll notice here is you'll notice that the waterways between these two land masses are, are seen right here if you take a look at this image as well. But in addition to that we can zoom in closer and we can see that this area right here is also copied right here as we see in Jordan and if we zoom in even closer we can see that the whole Nile Delta itself and even the images that we see where Kether represents more of a nebulous thing and the earth represents a solidified version that's the difference that's the reason why we see in Kabbalah Malkuth is Kether in another manner because this represents the nebulous spirit type thing and this represents the earthy the objectified the completely solidified and crystallized earth and that's the difference that we see here we can see that the whole uh, Nile Delta that we see follows the same pattern here as it does inside the trapezium area and then we can also pick out these areas right here all the way through something that may be easier for you to see here are these three rectangles after we have lined up the two we have the overall image of the Nile Delta and the overall image of the trapezium and then we zoom into these areas that we can see are repeated all the way through these areas here repeated all the way through into the nebula this area and for those of you who scream pareidolia this is not pareidolia this is image recognition this is image recognition from an impression all the way to the objectified and we can see that these are repeated all the way through what makes this extremely mysterious is what we see right here in these particular images are grids that are created by man they in other words they are land structures and grids that are actually created by man it's not something like the leaf matching a tree it's not like a natural thing it's something that was recently done by man yet we can see that these images are repeated all the way through into the nebula something 1300 light years away which means that this would have had to have been done before this according to what we know as far as science goes today so somehow in this new that this was going to be done. 
very, very mysterious, but yet the mirror still exists. And therefore we have the two great faces, one looking down, one looking up from the shadows below. And why, uh, should, for instance, would it be called the Tomb of Hermes? What and who was Hermes? Hermes was the Greek in, uh, form of the deity Mercury. And the Egyptian form of Mercury and Hermes was Thoth, the god of the writing tablet. Hermes was a symbol of the universal mind, because it was said of him in his own day, whenever that was, because he is probably also a symbol invented by the Alexandrian esotericists. He is not known prior to the rise of Alexandria. What was that he was the author of 10,000 books, and some of the old stories tell us that he was the author of every book that was ever written in the world. Well, the implication is pretty obvious. Namely, that he has to represent the power of mind, which is the author of all things. Therefore, Hermes is universal mind. He is the uh, universal mind that may have been symbolically buried in the Great Pyramid, which is supposed to have been his tomb. So the Great Pyramid was supposedly Hermes' tomb. Okay, so keep that in your head. Not a, a burial, but the universal mind itself, which in turn might point out the idea uh, of a universal symbolism, that the secret of the mind was built into the structure of the pyramid, and therefore the investigation of the pyramid could ultimately lead to the discovery of the nature of mind. Okay, so we see here in St. Joseph's Cathedral, uh, this artwork that was done a long time ago, that the pyramid that sits on top of the archetypal image that we see all the time is God the Father. God the Father that we see here with the pyramid behind his head, with the air shafts matching the same angles that we see in the pyramid right here. This is, here we get our geometry for this. And so the pyramid is showing us here same angles, same air shaft levels from the base of this thing that we see right here on both sides. It's showing us this mind this uh, that he's describing, the layout for mind, for universal mind that he's actually describing. And this is from 1877, St. Joseph Cathedral. This was actually shortly after, I believe, they discovered the air shafts as well. Now tying that to Osiris, we see that in Pyramid Text Utterance 600, this king is Osiris, the pyramid of the king is Osiris. This construction of his is Osiris. We see that in Utterance 600. So Osiris is being, is, this construction of the pyramid is actually said to be Osiris. Now Osiris, we need to further understand what that is because when we talk about Osiris, what area are we talking about? Well, we already know that Osiris is the invisible god born into his own son Horus, so it's referring to that same area. It's referring to the center of the Orion Nebula, which is the trapezium. Well, this is important because when we take a look at the trapezium of the Orion Nebula, as compared to what we see here in Utterance 600, that the construction of the pyramid is Osiris, we see something very important. From Klaus Dona's work, where he found this Orion pyramid here, with the eye on top of it, because remember the Adamus is the eye, the light that radiated from the light. He is the eye of the light, if you recall. And we have the pyramid here, and then on the back of it we have Orion. And right here it says the sun of the Creator comes, but the sun of the Creator is this area right here, because it's the first born out of creation. Now. The interesting thing about the trapezium that we see here is that the trapezium and the angles and the slopes of it match the angles of the Great Pyramid at 51 some odd degrees, 51.8 degrees. And we can see that the peculiar architecture of the pyramid shows in itself the drift of the metaphysical thought of their builders. The apex of the, is lost in the clear blue sky of the land of the pharaohs and typ typifies the primordial point 
lost in the unseen universe from whence started the first race of the spiritual prototypes of man, which is the Christ, which is Adam, which is the reason why the, the trapezium here matches the same slopes as we see on the Great Pyramid, and the reason why we see this is Orion and the Son of the Creator comes because this is the Son of the Creator right here, and this is what produces all of the matter in our universe, or our universe that relates to us. Now there's many of these out in the universe, and so this area represents the archetypal realm of the human race. We also have Hermes giving to us one of the great principles which was later to influence uh, all our knowledge, and that is the great concept of analogical resemblances. Uh, long ago it is said that Alexander the Great, while king of Macedonia, went out into the desert to visit the tomb of Hermes. Open Remember, the tomb of Hermes is the pyramids now. Opening this tomb, he gazed down upon the great sage of the past, whose body and bones had moved to ashes. But he saw among the ashes the great emerald tablet, known as the Emerald Table of Hermes. Emerald tablet, not tablets, like you hear nowadays. There's only one of them. Which contained upon it the great Hermetic inscription which opens with the rule or law or statement which has since become world famous that which is above is like unto that which is below that which is below is like unto that which is above now there's something I forgot to show you as far as the mirror goes but this ties us to the Mayan connection because in Mirador Park which is the cradle of the Mayan civilization we see that the act of seating the stones in the triangular pattern of the hearth created an image on the face of the earth and in the sky at the same time. This is the three hearthstones of creation that we see right here. And in the middle is the Orion Nebula. Seating those three created an image in the sky and the earth at the same time. There's our mirror that we see. The triangle is formed by the three hearthstones and in the center of it the Maya identified as the place of origin the seat of creation represented by the smoke that comes out of the burning fire and so we see that another indication in their stories that an image of the face is created a mirror of it is created in the sky and the earth at the same time the Nile Delta represents the triangle that is on the earth and the Orion Nebula represents the triangle that's in the heavens. Here in the um, this is from Kabbalah, the secret teaching of all ages, we see that the brow of God and his eyes formed a triangle in heaven and its reflection formed a second triangle in the waters. Well, if we take a look at this right here, the triangle is situated right on top of the brow, the brow being the pineal gland of the brain. This particular triangle right here is also seen in both the heavens and on earth. This is the triangle that we see in the waters. This is the triangle that we see in the heavens. So you can see all of this is confirmed all the way across culture and from Kabbalah to the Bible to everything that we see the angel cloth of the clown, the seventh angel all of this stuff. This parallel created the entire concept of medieval science a science based upon the similarities of things the idea of macrocosm and microcosm that the universe was the great man and man the little universe. And while we have theoretically outgrown much of this thinking, as Thorndike explains it, it is still true that the law of analogy is operating in our lives every day as a force in our thinking and is also a powerful instrument of scientific research within certain limitations. So the hermetic concept of analogy stands out in a strange intensity 
We can probably trace the thinking to earlier periods and far places, but the statement, the bringing together of the idea and its clarification seemingly was part of the Hermetic tradition. Now this matter, we have to believe Hermes, the great uh, Egyptian... Uh, this is referring to Jacob's Ladder to the Stars. Mystic, the thermaturgist, of whom, whose life nothing is known. But anyway, in his emerald tablet, Hermes declares that the above is like the, like the below, the superior is like the inferior, the lesser is like the greater, the greater is like the lesser. All things follow one immense pattern, and if anyone can break the mystery of that pattern in any one point, any one level, he has the key to the whole mystery. And the pattern, of course, is man. Now this individual has followed this line through. He then comes as the Egyptian mystery shows and the Eleusinia and the back of the Nosarian mysteries. He comes into the presence of the Great One. In this sense, in Egypt, we follow very closely the story in the Apocalypse of John. So we come to the great figure walking among the candlesticks, gathering the stars. This is a symbol of that which is above these limitations. This is a release in which the individual, having step by step overcome the impediments which he has placed upon himself or has permitted to society to place upon him through wrong education and wrong laws, that the uh, individual comes into the presence of Osiris in Egypt and comes into the presence of the Lord with the stars and the candlesticks. And in every religion there is some. So we see the same thing. The Lord with the stars and the candlesticks is the same as we see when we take a look at <clears throat> the seventh angel, which is the angel clothed with a cloud. And, uh, and so then we have a couple other things to take a look at that I've already given you in the last video, but we'll just review them real quick. It's speaking of the Merkava here, by the face of the man is meant the face of the male and female blended into one, which is what we see in Michelangelo's painting. In Kabbalistic terms, he's termed the heavenly man, the Adam Cadman, the Merkava, or chariot. The Merkava that we hear about from Ezekiel as well. He hides himself in the waters and makes the clouds his chariot. That's what we see right here. This is the angel here, clothed with a cloud, which is mind. He made the stars also. And if we take a look at Job 9.9, 9, we can see that he made the stars, the bear, Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the southern sky. It doesn't say all of the sky. It says the southern sky. It's referring to a specific location, and that would be the Orion Nebula. We also know that the Orion Nebula is most likely the candidate of the creation of the stars in Orion, because we see the large Fibonacci spiral that goes into the very center, uh, which goes all across the whole Orion constellation. When the Holy One created man to dwell upon the earth, he formed him after the likeness of the Adam Cabman, the heavenly man. And that's the reason why we see that this represents the same archetype that we see of man. And by the way, man, if you look up etym etymology for man, it is another word for mind. It's the symbol of Manus, the mind thinker. And what I find really interesting about uh, the Gospel of Judas here A great angel, and uh, he said, "There, which no eye has ever seen, and a luminous cloud appeared there. We see this luminous cloud all the time, God's cloud. God's cloud is the Orion Nebula, the one that the stars and planets move around. Adam was the first in the luminous cloud, and this represents man. It represents man, its very first creation, which is also the same as Christ. 
And at the very last here, we see here what Jesus said to Judah. Ju Judas, he said, Look, you've been told everything. Lift up your eyes and look at the cloud and the light within it and the stars surrounding it. It's a perfect description of the Orion Nebula. The light within it and the stars surrounding it. The star that leads the way is your star. Judas lifted up his eyes, saw the luminous cloud, and he entered it. Now there are so many more examples that we can find in the Bible, we can find in the mysteries of Egypt, that we can find in Kabbalah, that we can find in so many other areas. But uh, we have some things here that, that could be or should be submitted to science for them to take a look at as far as the uh, obvious uh, mirror that is going on. Uh, I think that with that kind of information that they could understand the universe a lot better since we can understand the macrocosm versus the microcosm. Um, there are also even papers with them showing that they believe that the universe is acting like a giant brain. So we have this macrocosm versus microcosm version of this going on. Uh, but this is the Orion mystery and this is the Orion mystery solved and there are so many points of confirmation from across culture uh, mentioning the cloud, mentioning Orion, mentioning the heavenly and celestial Adam, the first born out of the infinite, Christ, and all this other stuff. Uh, what it would really serve to do best for humanity is to show that everybody that all of these different cultures, all of these different teachings are talking about the same thing. And it's not a matter of worship. It's not a matter of religion. It's a matter of understanding reality. And it would sure serve humanity well if everybody would take a look at all of this, do comparative analysis, and see that all of these cultures are talking about the exact same thing, and in all of these points, everything has been confirmed. So you guys take care. I'll talk to you soon.